this evening we've started with the theme of casting a shadow. But I hope that you've been seeing that there's another theme that's emerging from all of our speakers the whole evening. And that is decisions or choices. Whether it's from our first speaker who spoke about how we need to be ready when your plan doesn't work out and recover from that. Or our last speaker who was talking about choosing happiness and choosing an attitude of gratitude. It all comes down to personal choices that we're making every day. Whether those are decisions that we own or the decisions that somebody else owns that we need to influence. So when I think about what is going to ultimately impact your success in life, it's going to be your decisions, the things that you can influence and you can control. And there are lots of things in life that you can't control, and those are uncertainties. But if you make the best decisions you can, then you can live with no regret. So my theme is talking about seizing your decision power. And the first thing that I want you to do is to shift your frame a little bit about casting shadow. I want you to think of yourself as transforming your light, as being a prism, as being able to direct the light and cast a technicolor shadow to add light to the world. And your decisions are fundamental to this. Now, everybody has different values and different passions. So what you choose to do is going to be different from everybody else. And you're going to need all kinds of decisions over the course of your life. So how can I provide you with a tool or a tool set of decision skills that will help you with all your decisions? Well, it's a little bit of a challenge, but I've got a place to start. The first thing is you have to see your decisions. You have to be aware of your decisions. And you have to do what we call declaring a decision. Now, declaring a decision is more than just being aware that you've got a decision situation. It's saying, I'm actually going to do something about it. I'm going to think about it. And I'm going to act upon it. And that's different from going with the flow and just seeing how things turn out. It's different from stimulus and response. It's driving a wedge of conscious choice when you see an opportunity to make a difference with a decision. And sometimes it's an instant when you have to stop yourself and think and decide before you act. And other times you can see it coming and you can plan for it. And when you've got more time to plan, then there's a tool I'd like to introduce you to. It's called a decision chain. If you can internalize this and make this a checklist, then you'd have an opportunity to actually use it in the moment. But this is the kind of tool that's used by consultants in big business, making billion dollar bets. And my personal ambition in life is to make this accessible to people in their personal lives. And one of the reasons why that is so important to me is because I grew up with it. When I look back on my life, I know that it's made a difference. And so I want to help others um, to have those same decision skills that I grew up with. So there are six elements of any decision, and we've represented them here as a decision chain. You might ask yourself, why a chain? Well, what is it about a chain? It's only as strong as its weakest link. So if any of these six elements are weak, that's how strong your decision is. And I'm going to teach you how to take those six elements and count them on the five fingers of your hand. So the first element is a helpful decision frame. It's not always clear what the decision is that you're making. There's no right frame, but there may be a more helpful frame than the one that you see. And if there are two people that are involved in your decision, or more, then those people are likely to see different decisions. And if it's a shared decision, then you'd better be able to agree on the frame. If not, you might be having the right answer to the wrong decision. And that's more likely to destroy value than to create value. So first of all, it's a frame. Second of all, it's clear values. What are the things that you want from your decision? And you can't always get everything that you want. So there are likely to be trade-offs 
And you're going to need to prioritize between those different values. Third, creative alternatives. Now, it's almost human nature to drive a decision down to the point where you say, I'm either going to do it or I'm not going to do it. In fact, many people feel like they don't even have a choice. They just have to do it. Well, if you don't have any alternatives, then you don't have a decision. And your decision can only be as good as your best alternative. So if you can actively create space to be able to generate and be creative with more alternatives, that's going to add a huge amount of value in your life and in any decision you face. Next one is useful information. Now this is one of the toughest things about decisions. We all, in school, we're learning about data and facts. How often do they talk about uncertainty in school? Decisions are about the future. The future is uncertain. We need to be able to use the language of probability to think about how things are uncertain in the future. And often what we think is certain is anything but. So we've got tools to deal with that. And it's in the sound reasoning area that we bring them together. So sound reasoning brings together what you want the values with what you can know the information to figure out what's the alternative that's going to give you most of what you want given what you can know. And not make any logical errors. And then finally, we have commitment to follow through. So we've got frame, we've got values, we've got alternatives, we've got information, and we've got reasoning. How many of you have made a decision and then not follow through. Not a very strong decision, right? So the final one is commitment to follow through. And it's not keeping something. It's not a fit. It's grabbing the decision and moving forward. Okay, so that's pretty on strength. We need a real decision to work on. I'm going to give you a personal decision that I face. Actually, a bunch of decisions that we're all tied together. So this is when I was graduating from college. I decided to go and live in Ukraine. Ukraine was former Soviet Union. I had studied Russian. I was learning about the socialist countries and transformation because back then they were. This was in 1996. I lived in a little town in the furthest western part of Ukraine called Uzhgorod. It was a great experience. I had gone and got a job. I was teaching at the local institute of uh, business. Um, life was moving. So I had this friend who was one of my best friends in college, and he was always threatening to come visit. He wanted to go and travel around Europe together. And I said, that'd be great, Andrew. Let's go. But I never heard anything from him. So I've got my wife going in Ukraine, and suddenly, the call. And it's Andrew on the phone. And Andrew says, Chris, I'm at the airport. If you want to see me and travel, I'm going to be in Italy on Friday, two days away. Meet me at 5 o'clock at the Uffizi. Now, the Uffizi is the big museum in Florence, Italy. So, I'm saying, Andrew, two days, I got a job, I've got a life, I've got responsibilities, I can't just pick up and leave. I mean, Chris, I'm at the airport right now, I've got to go, if you want to see me, 5 o'clock Friday at the Uffizi. Click. All right, so this is decision number one. Decision frame number one. What do you think I do? Responsibilities? Or adventure living. Now remember, I was just outside of college. I went to my boss. I said, I gotta go. He said, okay, I'll give you some space. I threw my backpack in the car, I got in the car, and I started driving. And I drove from Mushirad all the way down to Florence. And it says on the map that it takes 12 hours, but you gotta understand. The Ukrainian border in between is kind of like a war zone. 
Even back then, now Ukraine's got a war zone in it. So this was quite something to do. But I got there. Five o'clock at the refusal. And there I am. In Italy. And there's Andrew with me in Italy. So the first thing was, good decision, good outcome. We're together in Italy. But now, Andrew's a really interesting character. He has a philosophy about travel. He says, well, you know, Chris, the most interesting place to travel is where there's been some sort of a disturbance recently. Because there are no tourists. It's really authentic. And the people will be really excited to see us because they haven't seen any tourists lately. So we should go to Bosnia. Now, there had just been a war in Bosnia. But I understand, there are 40,000 U.S. Marines in Bosnia. What could be safer? Here's Andrew working on me. What about Boston? All right, so let's think about our decision frame. First frame was, should I go to Italy or not? Now we've got the decision frame of, I'm in Italy, but should I go to Bosnia or not? Not about a car, so I can get us there. Well, hold on a second. So, Let's talk about the clear values here. Why would I want to go to Boston? Well, it sounds really great, right? Great experience. Uh, why would I not want to go to Boston? Well, I could die. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe I'm on death. Um, car could get stolen. Um, maybe we could get in a fight, get thrown in jail. Um, yeah, bad things could happen. But good things could happen. We could have a great time. Right? Notice there's a, there's a trade-off going on here I'm thinking about. Um, I can think of some creative alternatives of things that we could do in Bosnia. I could do some creative alternatives of things that we could do in Italy. But it's these uncertainties about what might happen in Bosnia that have me concerned, right? And there's no problem. It'll be great. Nothing will happen. All right, a little sound reasoning here. Maybe there's a difference between the way that the parents might think about this and the youth. That would be a difference of frames, a difference in values. I don't know about the commitment to follow through at this point. There's a third frame that's going on now. And this is what I'm really thinking about. Back in Ujgurad, there's a girl. And this particular girl has just gotten into a master's program in the United States. And so she's only got about two weeks left in Ukraine. So every day that I'm in Italy is a day less that she's in Ujgara. And of course, nothing had been said between us that was romantic. She was just a friend. She was the translator for the Peace Corps volunteering task, so we kind of become friends in a safe environment. So I'm in Italy, and I'm thinking, is that a girlfriend? But she's going to be going to the United States. And if I wasn't serious about this, then I have no right to be saying anything one way or the other about being interested in her, maybe even falling in love with her. So I have escalated my frame all the way to the point where I was thinking, if I say anything to her, do I have to marry her? Now, I'm 23, and I'm in Italy, thinking about going to Bosnia, but I've got a decision to make, right? Well, what's the decision? This is where the chain becomes helpful. And I knew about the chain because I had learned about it from some people that are the uh, pioneers of decision analysis. And I had the presence of mind to say, what's my weakest link? And once I asked that, it was very clear to me. It's useful information. I don't even know what she would say. 
And when I did that, it shifted my frame. Because I realized that the real thing that was going on was whether or not I could live without asking for that information. So, I took my friends to the train station. He went off and had an adventure at, in Bosnia. And it was a great time, I understand. I went back to Ukraine and I wrote a very um, ambiguous poem that allowed the girl to say one way or another whether or not she liked me. And then she said nothing. All right. Now here's the question. Did I make a good decision? I made a decision to go back to Ukraine. I had strength in my chain. I knew that I was after useful information. At that point, I had a bad outcome. There's a separation between the decision and the outcome. People get this mixed up all the time. If you make a good decision, if you've got strength in the chain, it doesn't matter what the outcome is. You can have a good decision with a bad outcome. You can have a bad decision with a good outcome. You've got to make that separation and strengthen the chain. Now, I was teaching this young woman to drive in the United States so that she could drive in the United States. And I had the opportunity to get her driving and pin behind the wheel. And I showed my grit, I showed my resilience. I said, hey, Svetlana, what about that poem? You didn't say anything. And it turned out she was so anxious you can say anything. It was such a high risk thing that she didn't say anything, even though she wanted to. Tell me that she was also very interested in me. And then we were both in love. And then she took off and went to the United States and left me all alone in Ukraine and covered land. And I had to make my next choice, which was whether or not to go back to the United States. And I did. And I had a strong chain. I made one of the best decisions of my life. This is my wife Svetlana and our three boys. Svetlana's here with me this evening. She has allowed me to tell this story so that I can get across the power of uh, decision making. And at the core is the six elements of making a good decision. You can remember them on the palm of your hand. And what I want you all to do is go and claim your decision power. And I want to wish you the best of decisions, but even more, I want to wish you the best of outcomes. Thank you.